Well, good morning, Columbia United Church of Christ. Um, it is Friday, March 27th, and we are here for our chancel chat. Um, we've been looking at the book of Exodus this week, uh, but today and tomorrow we're going to return to the Psalms. Um, we'll return, we'll go back to Exodus again next week, but we're going to look at Psalms today and tomorrow, Psalm 33 and Psalm 34. And uh, as we do, I invite you to, uh, to remember the plight of the Israelites that we read about earlier this week in the Psalms, and that God heard their plea for help, and God led them out of Egypt. So as you listen to this Psalm, I want you to listen to it through the lenses, or view it through the lenses as you listen, of the Israelites, remembering the history of the Exodus as part of their national identity. And this is Psalm 33. Mari, is that better? All right. We're going to start Psalm 33 again. Okay, thank you, Anne. I got your note there, too. We'll see if this is a little bit better. This is all a learning experience, right? We're, we're learning new things here. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Mari. Um, I see Darla and Lauren. And uh, let's see, Darla, Lauren, Mari. Uh, good morning to all of you. And Anne. All right. And Marion. Hi. So we're going to read Psalm 33 here. It says, Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Praise the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to God with the harp of ten strings. Sing to God a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. For the word of God is upright. All God's work is done in faithfulness. God loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of God's steadfast love. By the word of God the heavens were made, and all their hosts by the breath of God's mouth. God gathered the waters of the sea as in a bottle. God put the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth respect and know God. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of God. For God spoke and it came to be. God commanded and it stood firm. God brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. God frustrates the plans of the poor. The counsel of the Lord stands forever the thought of God's heart to all generations. Happy is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom God chose as God's heritage. God looks down from heaven. God sees all humankind. From where God sits enthroned, God watches all the inhabitants of the earth. God, who fashions the hearts of them all, observes all their needs. A king is not saved by a great army. A warrior is not delivered by great strength. The war horse is a vain hope for victory, and by its great might it cannot save. Truly the eye of the Lord is on those who know and respect God, on those who hope in God's steadfast love to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. God is our help and shield. Our heart is glad in God because we trust God's holy name. Let your steadfast love, O God, be upon us, even as we hope in you. So Psalm 33 is known as a hymn of praise, but it is also a hymn of praise with a specific purpose. It proclaims that God is trustworthy, that the righteous may faithfully place their trust and their hope in God, and God will not fail. Psalm 33 is also symbolic of completion. There are 22 verses in Psalm 33 and 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. This structure is common among psalms. Acrostic psalms have verses in multiples of 22 with, with each verse starting with a corresponding letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Now, this psalm is not an acrostic because the first words do not start with the Hebrew letter that corresponds to that verse, but it does number 22 verses, and that's not insignificant. It's not a coincidence. Some scholars hypothesize that this is meant to symbolize that the psalm is meant to be as complete and comprehensive in covering its subject as the alphabet is in listing the letters. In other words, the psalm comprehensively encapsulates the greatness and goodness of God according to this psalmist. 
Not that anyone can fully know God, but in its structure, the psalmist is implying completion. So if we look at this psalm in its entirety, it could bring assurance to us in our current global situation. The entirety of this psalm gives hope that God is with us, giving us comfort and assurance in times of challenge. In the midst of the challenge where we find ourselves, this is comfort, comfort indeed. God's presence is with us, even in these days, and the completion aspect of this psalm tells us that even though we feel like our world is in disarray, it is really in God's hands, and it is good. Looking at the individual verses of the psalm, however, we find even more specific wisdom. It's great to issue a blanket statement such as, relax, God is with you, but when we are enmeshed in the messiness of our global situation, those blanket statements don't always bring comfort. We need to look at the specifics and see how God is with us. There are a few verses that stand out to me today, and perhaps we could gain wisdom from looking at those. The first ones I want to dig into are verses 10 through 12. God brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. God frustrates the plans of the poor. The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the thought of God's heart to all generations. Happy is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom God has chosen as God's heritage. The situation we are in right now globally, is an illustration how the best laid plans of people and the council of nations can be frustrated by God's cosmic vision. God's vision is so much greater than we can imagine, and when we make plans with our minuscule vision, we have no comprehension of God's cosmic vision. Now, when I say that, that can be misinterpreted for, to project an aspect on God that is less than accurate, to say that God intentionally thwarts our plans by inflicting misery upon us to teach us a lesson or to guide us with some wisdom. That's not what I'm saying here, and I don't think that viewpoint is a very complimentary one of God. God does not inflict coronaviruses on people to teach them a lesson or to thwart our plans. But when coronaviruses do happen in our world, I think it causes us to realize just how separated our plans are from God's plans. The plans of the world are laughable to God because the plans of the world are so short-sighted. We make plans for today with no thought of tomorrow, or if we do think of tomorrow, it's only our tomorrow. It's time that we start thinking about how we fit into God's plans. We need to think globally, universally, about how this entire system of worldly existence fits into the grand scheme of things and how we are part of that system. When we can think globally and universally, we will begin to be part of God's cosmic vision. God's counsel stands forever. God's heart is to all generations, all time and space. When our hearts are for all generations instead of just our own, we may begin to understand God's eternal counsel. Verses 16 through 17 stand out for me as well. A king is not saved by a great army. A warrior is not delivered by great strength. A war horse is a vain hope for victory and by its great might it cannot save. These verses speak of the folly of narcissistic leadership. A king is not saved by a great army. A warrior is not delivered by great strength. Look at what he, we have learned these past few weeks. The United States spends more each year on military might than China, Saudi Arabia, India, France, Russia, the United Kingdom, and Germany all combined. Yet with our disproportionate military spending, we have been humbled by a microscopic virus, an invisible germ. We're not saved by a mighty army. We are not delivered by great strength. Military might is a vain hope for victory in God's cosmic vision. We must put our hope and our trust in God. Our hope is in God's steadfast love. Verses 16 through 17 indict our civilization at its very core. The structure we have built as a society is built on accumulation of things, greed, 
narcissism, and sociopathic tendencies. This is nothing new. The building blocks for this structure were laid as early as the 10th century when the upper 2% of society really began accumulating wealth in earnest. We have built the foundation of our, of our modern society on these same principles, and now, with the aid of a microscopic virus, that societal structure is showing signs of weakness. But through the cracks of that crumbling structure, we see light shining through. The stories are beginning to accumulate of God's people doing God's work in a time such as this. Food distribution, helping one another with challenges, working together, even though socially isolated, to help others through times of stress. This is the new foundation on which we must build a new society in the aftermath of this, a foundation based on principles advocated by God, no matter what name you choose to use for God. Verses 20 through 22 say it best. Our soul waits for the Lord. God is our help and our shield. Our heart is glad in God because we trust God's holy name. Let your steadfast love, O God, be upon us, even as we hope in you. Let us pray. Creator God, as we gather together in prayer, we remember the words of your psalmist and we echo them also. Dear God, our souls wait for you. You, dear God, are our hope. You are our shield. Our heart is glad because we trust in you, O God, because we trust in your holy name. Let your steadfast love, O God, be upon us, even as we hope in you. Amen. Have a good day. Remember, you are blessed children of God. Be a blessing. Amen.